everybody to the NPA. Thanks for a great community dinner. Everybody from the community dinner team, thank you. We have a great agenda tonight. Um, wanted to go over our ground rules, listen to others speaking, respect the agenda and process, share your opinion politely, treat people respectfully. We'll um, go around and introduce ourselves. This is the ground rules, introductions, and announcements part of the agenda. So introduce yourself and the ward you're from. Thanks. Jeff Clark, Ward 4 and Steering Committee. Linda Deladuco, Ward 7, Steering Committee. Uh, Bob Hooper, State Representative, Ward 4. Gino Sullivan, State Representative, Ward 7. Hi, Jenna O'Donnell, Ward 4 Steering Committee. Um, for somewhat obvious reasons, I'm going to be stepping back for a little bit from the NPA Steering Committee, but it's been really great working with you, and I'll see you again soon with a new one. Hi, Brian Williams, Ward 7. Eric Munson, Curtis Avenue. Miyako Zeki, Ward 7. Molly Mordike, Ward 7. Amy Bielowski Branch, Ward 7. Linda Mordai, Ward 7. Hans Haeckel, Ward 4. Kathy Haeckel, Ward 4. David Driscoll, Ward 4 Steering Committee. Al Bellucci, Ward 7. Monica Ivantich, Ward 7, School Commissioner. Martine Gulick, Ward 4, School Commissioner. Michelle Clark, Ward 4. Carol Odie, Ward 4 and um, State Representative. Kendra Sowers, Ward 4 and North District School Commissioner. Karina Driscoll, Ward 4. Travis Bragg, Ward 7. Keenan Christensen, Ward 7. Cheryl O'Donnell, Ward 4. Jeff O'Donnell, Ward 4. Stephen Hamlin, Ward 7. Carmen George, Ward 7. Lynn. Marcella Constantino, Ward 7. Matt Herbert, Ward 7. Ali Jang, Alderman, Ward 7. Jackie Schultz, Ward 4. Nancy Ellis, Ward 4. Russell Ellis, Ward 4. Sal Millichamp, Ward 4. Nick Carver, Ward 4. Uh, Tony Reddington, Pine Street Coalition, member of the two, Ward 2 3 Steering Committee, and Ward 2. Great. Did we get everybody? For announcements, I um, wanted to let everybody know that on the agenda, you can get to the agenda on the CETA website. Um, from Burlington's city website, and the agendas are located there. If you'd like us to consider something to present for the next NPA, there's a link on that as well. Um, request to present at the NPA. There's a link right on the agenda website. So um, feel free to go there. And as Jenna mentioned, we're looking for steering committee members as well, if you're considering joining the steering committee. So um, come on and join. Any other announcements for anybody? And we don't have a December meeting. We're going right to January. Hi, I'm Keenan again. Um, I just wanted to let folks know, I'm, as many folks already know, that we every month before the MPA, except for next month because there is no MPA, we're doing our community dinner. It starts at 5.30, goes till 6.30. Um, it's free, so feel free to come and enjoy free meal with your uh, neighbors and friends. If you're interested in getting involved, we have a sign-up sheet in the back, and we'd love to have you. I did want to remind folks that tomorrow night is our uh, new North End book group. We're meeting at Simple Roots um, from 6 to 8, and this month we read The Power. And uh, if you come tomorrow night, you can help us choose our next book. Thank you.
No other announcements. We'll go right into elected officials. If you all want to come up to the table. Everybody could do a two minute update and then we will go to questions from the, the group. I think I will start by saying thank you to the people of both Ward 7 and Ward 4 for bringing us together around to break bread, like they say. I think this is exactly the say that the new North End is changing. This is a great, wonderful example. But I want to thank um, those people. We have Travis, Carmen, Karina, um, Abby, so many people. Thank you very much for doing this. This is great. Please give them a round of applause. Yeah. Um, yeah, so many behind the scene. You know, some people are still cleaning up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, in the city of Burlington, there are so many great things happening. And it's about all ballot items. That's what the council is working on. So we have one. That's about the non-citizen voting. There will be one about rank voting. Um, there will be several ones. So the um, Charter Change Committee is very busy. As you probably know also, the hole on the ground will no longer be a hole on the ground anymore soon. Let's hope so. Uh, because we received a great presentation that actually the size of the building is going down to 10 stories and the parking, around 300 parking, will still be there. Um, yes, we also have the new roundabout that will be on Shelburne Road, you know, between Lockheed Street, around that area. So the council, yes, did, I think, Tony Reddington here is very happy about it. So it costs about $7 million. And what's good about it, it is the state and the federal government that will pay entirely about it. Uh, so I think that's a great, great, wonderful thing. It will make Burlington more welcoming, you know, and it will reduce accidents. But the council currently are just considering a couple of options as to how do we m mitigate um, during the construction that will take about two years, and there are some businesses there, um, and we're working with them in making sure that um, their businesses will keep on running. That's two. Um, yeah, there are several, but I think this one is very important, and it's about Franklin Square. Many people here don't go there, but as you probably know, it has been forgotten for years, over 10 years, between the city and Burlington Housing Authority. But under the leadership, our leadership, you know, the city took it back up, and now the city is working with Burlington Housing Authority for the city to own now that street. So we're talking about making it better, snow removal, and all of that. So for now, I can stop on that. I'm Carol Odie, and I represent um, one of the two reps from um, District 6-1, which is the far new north end. So um, tonight, I thought I'd fill you in about what's happening at um, UVM. UVM's um, Board of Trustees has 25 members. Two are appointed by the governors. Excuse me, three are appointed by the governor. Um, nine are self-perpetuating. 
two are students, one undergrad and one grad. Um, the governor and the president serve ex officio on the board. And then um, the 150 state representatives and 30 state senators vote for nine legislative trustees. And last winter, I ran to be one of the nine legislative trustees, and I won. So I'm, I've been serving since the uh, late winter. So um, at our last board meeting, uh, we visited Innovation Hall, which is a new um, place where the sciences are taught, among other things. And uh, we went to two different classrooms. And one is, um, was a large classroom where physics is taught. And after the lesson is taught by the professor, the um, students sit together at tables, and the, professors, the professor um, goes around to the students. And when there's a problem that they're having that they're having trouble solving, then the professor makes notes on a um, like an iPad type thing, and then it's projected on screens all around the room so the kids can see what their fellow students are having trouble with, and they can um, learn better. And I know this works because we have a wonderful teacher, we have many wonderful teachers in our school system, and one of them is Mr. Tremblay, Norm Tremblay, who teaches math at the high school. And when I was on the school board, I visited many classrooms, and one of them was his. And he teaches math the exact same way as that. Um, he listens, he teaches the, a short lesson in algebra, for example, and then the kids start their homework. And then as they are, you know, when I was in school, I would have trouble with my homework. As soon as I, I think, well, yeah, that looks good, and then I'd go home and try to do the math, and I got stuck. And so Mr. Trombley knew that, and um, he knows that, and he has the kids start their homework right in class. And then when they're having trouble, he stops everybody and he goes up to the board and he has, um, he has one or two students go and show their work um, so that they can learn the, um, the math. So, and another thing that's happening there is chemistry is something where a lot of um, kids were dropping out of chemistry after taking Chem 1 at UVM. And so a new professor, who is the new chair of the department, who actually lives on Stanford Road, um, he aligned the curriculum with what's happening in the labs so that the kids would learn a subject matter, like reduction oxidation, which is um, when things rust. And then they do the experiment that had to do with that topic in their lab. As a result, kids are understanding chemistry better. And instead of only about 200 kids going from chemistry one to chemistry two, now 750 kids are going from chemistry one to chemistry two. So that's a little of what I observed, and I look forward to bringing more information from you about UVM. My time's up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Hooper. I sit in 6-1 with Carol. Um, I am in the middle of sort of writing something up for, on Porch Forum, so I'll just hit the top up. And, uh, you can read it there. Um, in the middle of starting to type it, my space bar went, so Best Buy now has my laptop for a couple of weeks. Um, in the two minutes, I've been meeting on F-35 concerns. We met with the airport recently. We also met with the National Guard. Um, a lot of information was transferred from the domain of this is what's going on to this is what people think is going on and this is what we can do, this is what we can't do. <laughs> pretty complicated process um, that's pretty far down the road, I think, as far as change. Um, another thing that has come on my radar is uh, the Living Well, um, what used to be Champlain Valley Agency on Aging met with them uh, a couple of days ago on their programs, uh, very worthwhile. Um, some of you might have seen uh, on Facebook, I wrote up a little thing about the Convention of States that I'm hearing from people about, and I think all legislators are. It's a, a weird thing where under Article 5 of the Constitution, uh, people were trying to get the states to basically take back a lot of power. The weird thing about it is you're hearing one proposal from people on the left and their proposal from people on the right. 
personally, after doing some investigation, I think it's the people that are really anti-federal government that are driving both groups to try to ask for something that neither one of them are going to be happy with. Um, one care is uh, something that's on our radar because as a member of the State Employees Insurance Group, we just had a little uh, realization from Blue Cross Blue Shield that they were transferring everybody into it kind of without anybody's knowledge. It's uh, something that's really sort of puzzling at this point. Last year, the auditor's office wanted to look at it and couldn't. Um, so it's on my radar as something that we should probably be looking at uh, as supposedly costing us less, but nobody at this point is really able to explain to me how. Um, so keep an eye on Front Porch Forum. I'll try to put something up there soon. Hi there. I'm Jean O'Sullivan. I'm state rep for 62, which is the old and new north end. Um, so a couple of projects that are now coming back up to the fore. John Kalaki from South Burlington and I are working on recovery home legislation in the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. This is something I've been doing. I've, I've had this bill on the wall for maybe four years, and I think we've got consensus. The two parts of the bill, it's about recovery homes. In the opiate crisis, we have a real need for sober homes and recovery homes. And two challenges, technically, you can site a recovery home in a residential area, but it doesn't actually specifically say that in the legislation. So what happens is recovery home wants to, or a sober house, want, it comes in and says, okay, I'd like to, I'd like to that, open up an establishment. And then there's, immediate, there's immediately a zoning challenge, which then just costs a bunch of money for the lawyers to go and argue it. And eventually it comes out that yes, you can have this, it's perfectly zoned. So what we've done is basically we're, re we're putting in new language in the legislation and there shouldn't be too much problem with that. Just making it very, very clear so that challenge, we can save that money. The bigger challenge is eviction. And it is a challenge because when you're going into a recovery situation, you have people who are on Suboxone, you have people who are not on Suboxone, you've got people who are, are no, no medical, uh, medically assisted treatment. So within that construct, they all sign a pledge to maintain their therapy, whatever that may be. And if they violate that pledge, then they have to be, they have to be out of that community. That's understood within the therapeutic community. The challenge is, how do you write that up in landlord-tenant language so it doesn't then affect all of the years of work on landlord-tenant that we now that we have, and that and threading that needle is turning. To, that's what's been on the wall for four years. I think we've come to some agreement with all of the parties, and I know we'll get the zoning through this year. I'm not sure. We're still talking amongst ourselves as to whether we can get that language on the actual. If you violate the terms eviction, because you can't keep someone in a situation if they're out of sync with the recovery home and they're on, if they're violating their requirements and they're there for 30 days, that will be completely, it will, it will, it will not be helpful to the rest of the other tenants. So we're, we're sorting that out. Um, the other thorny thing we're doing in general housing and military affairs is two things. One, um, I've always worked on the issue about keeping the women in our, in our National Guard safe. And we have a report that comes every year on sexual assault, harassment, and um, general annoying behavior. Uh, it's really not enough. We've always known we needed something more. And this year, we got through an agreement, a gender report, that really talked about the difference in gender. Yes, it's binary, male, female at this point. But it, it clearly points out why women in the National Guard last about, they, they last about one rotation, and then they get out of the guard, because it's not conducive for them to have the military career they want. Um, 
that and that gender report really shows it. So the first thing we've got is the gender report was a negotiation from last year. This year we're going to make it a ma it'll be mandatory within the um, within the report. And the other thing, and this is going to be a tougher one, and I'm hoping we can get convinced people, but the legislature hires the adjutant general, which means that the legislature is responsible for the safety of every single guard member we have in the state. That means, every, and particularly, every single female guard member. And I might remind you that last year, when we had an expose in Vermont Digger, we found out that the environment was so bloody bad that even the beloved chaplain was a predator. So let's be clear, the women who are volunteering for the guard need better safety and we need to get it for them. So what we're gonna do is there's a position we wanna put in the adjutant general's office, but it would pay for by the state dealing with gender and diversity. Thank you. Monica Ivancic, Ward 7, um, and I wanted to let you know that, and most of you already know, that on Wednesday, November 6th, we got notice from our superintendent, Yao Bang, that as of end of this fiscal year, he will be stepping down as our superintendent. Um, he was, his original contract went for another year, um, but we got this notice, and I'd like to share with you a statement that the board had prepared um, the Burlington Board of School Commissioners thanks Superintendent O'Bank for his many accomplishments in serving the Burlington community during his five-year tenure. Under his leadership, the district's finances are stronger than they have been in many years. Our student voice is robust and engaged. Our district's commitment to an equitable and diverse workforce is steadfast. A 21st century 10-year capital improvement plan was created and initiated and the re-envisioning of our high school and tech center is moving forward. The Burlington School District is poised for future success thanks in part to his leadership. The board respects Superintendent O'Bang's desire for new challenges and looks forward to his continued executive leadership for the remainder of the school year. The Burlington School Board is prepared to immediately engage in a thorough nationwide search for our next superintendent and is committed to ensuring a smooth transition for our district. And I'll um, likely, my co-commissioners here, they are the chairs of the superintendent search committee. Um, they will share more with you about that search. Um, uh, Carol brought up a math teacher at the high school. I wanted to mention a different um, math teacher at the high school, Mr. Amoa, who is African and he uses song to teach kids math. And so the kids get reinforced the math by singing with him about it, which is kind of cool. Um, another thing that's going on in the high school tomorrow, the next day, and Saturday um, is a musical play called You're in Town. And um, I was told that it's not for elementary school kids, but middle and <laughs> high school kids and older are okay to go. Um, the plays are at 7 p.m. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, $5 for students and seniors, and $10 for adults. I'm Kendra Sowers, School Commissioner, North District. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the BHS BTC re-envisioning project that is still underway. Um, we are getting some new designs, and with the new designs, we're looking at the costs associated with it. I wanted to invite you all. There's a meeting tomorrow night um, at 5.30 in the BHS Cafe where you can actually see all the schematics, you can meet with the, the project manager. They're going to give you a lot of um, details. You can ask any questions. So it's a really great way of finding information out about the project. This happens every month, um, and you can always find information about that, um, that meeting on our BHS uh, or BSDBT website. Third Thursday of the month, yep. I'm not sure about December though, so just check when that is. Um, I also wanna talk about it's budget season, and so we are meeting with a lot of stakeholders. Um, last night we had information at our public board meeting from principals, what they're needing in the variety of schools. We also wanna hear from you all, so there's a link online on the website as well for your feedback if you have thoughts about you know, uh, programs that you would like to see added, if you want to have ideas of what 
you think that we could take away or any innovative ideas, we'd love to hear them. So please, please give us your feedback. Um, and also on that website, just go to the website. Um, there's this new video that was shown last night at the board meeting, which is really cool. It's a wonderful overview of our schools. It really shows the diversity. It shows a lot of the teachers that have been discussed tonight. It shows some of the innovative programming, like the City and Lake um, semester that we're now offering. So I'd love the, for you all to um, look at it, invite you to look at it, and, um, and see all the great things that we're doing in our schools. The last thing I want to talk about is there's a um, French immersion community meeting um, Tuesday, December 3rd, also on our website. There is um, there's a joint venture with the French, French Embassy and our schools, which is kind of cool. Um, there's a grant. It's really just an initial meeting to see the interest in the community. The grant also is looking for a community um, people who want to be certified in that program. The funds are provided through that grant. So if you would like to just hear more about it or are interested in the program, please come. It's at Hunt. It's at 6 p.m. again on December 3rd. Thank you. Hi, Martine Gulick, Ward 4 School Commissioner. I'm going to bookend our discussion. Ali thanked the dinner committee, and I want to thank the steering committee for all you do for the MPA. You guys work hard and do a great job. Thank you. I don't have too much else to add, except that we are going into budget season. And some of you may know that uh, we were hoping to negotiate a multi-year teacher's contract this year, but that is not going to happen because the Vermont NEA and the VSBA are kind of in a, in a bind right now in terms of negotiating health care costs. So it is now in the hands of an arbitrator, and we will find out what his decision is on December 15th. And at that point, uh, we will be able to uh, hopefully work on a, on a multi-year contract. But it remains to be seen. We're kind of waiting on, on what comes of that meeting and his decision. So, I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening to us. And I guess, are we taking questions? Hey, Kendra, what were you, I, I'm interested in the French, can you talk a little bit about what the people would do? I don't know if I would fit in that, but our family's really interested in French culture and French language. Yeah, it's really, I mean, we're, it's the initial meeting about it, so we don't know a ton of, of details, but it was to gauge the interest in an immersion program, I believe, at the middle school level which is why it's being at Hunt, but we're also needing community members to engage in that. Um, so they want to know if, they want to know what the interest level is in the community, and they want to know if there's any community members who are interested in becoming certified through that program. So um, we're trying to find out uh, what the agenda items and the goals specifically are for the meeting, and I, I will hope to post that on Front Porch Forum to let you guys know more details, but please reserve the date. For the school commissioners, what you read tonight, is that part of a settlement with the superintendent? The statement you read and the designation of the superintendent of schools, is that part of some kind of a settlement? You can't say, right? No, that wasn't a settlement. That was just a board statement in response. Was there a settlement with him? Oh, oh, is there a settlement? Um, no. No, not, not, not at this juncture, no. He's, he's going to finish off his, this year and get paid through this year and then, right. Yeah. No settlement, no agreement. Right. Thank you. Sorry, that was, a, that was a media statement that was given after the resignation from the board. Ali, you mentioned um, the roundabout. Where where on Shelburne Road is the roundabout? Is it near King Street? I mean, um, Christ the King? Yes. Because, you know, that, that I'm yes. curious why that project got picked. If you could talk a little bit about it, because the, the accident rate there is really almost non-existent, even though it's 
it's poorly designed. So I'm just curious how it got the federal funding. Um, I mean, I think it's through the Vermont uh, v -trans, Vermont Transportation, and the city basically has not a lot to do about it. And I think it is those type of things that they would want to uh, see improved. You know, and I think the benefits are more for the city of Burlington. And most of the time, many of these projects are paid by the city. And I think for this specific one, it is really to prevent from fatalities to happen, because it could happen anytime. It's also uh, designed in a way that the underground of that uh, roundabout, the current roundabout, is so messy. It's old, and I think we have a chance right here to get a new one, an upgraded one. Um, and uh, maybe uh, Tony can, can, can speak more about it later. Would you do a presentation? Yes. So you stay tuned. Tony will talk about it in detail um, today, right? Perfect. Um, Any other questions for the elected officials? I think we need questions, otherwise we'll just talk. This is also a city question, so also for Ali. Um, I'm wondering if the city council has addressed uh, Vermont Trans' plan to um, add an additional rail, rail line in front of one main street, and whether or not uh, the city council or the current administration can apply any pressure to or plan to apply any pressure to try to find an alternative uh, area to do that? Um, thank you for that question. And I think it's one of the biggest issues the city is currently dealing with. Um, personally, the city and VTRAN, we are working in making sure if there are other alternatives. Instead of our waterfront, how about uh, Essex or how about St. Albert? And also, we are working in making sure that the VTRAN, even if they have two trucks, they won't be able to build trains on our waterfront for environmental issues, for quality of life issues, for access issues, for our bike lane, for many, many, many things. And I think what is good about this, in my own perspective, this is only me, we brag about climate change, we brag about being a progressive city. We brag about all of this. But personally, I do think this would be great for the city. Think about it. How many of us go to New York through another area, through another, um, through New York, you know, taking the train in, how do you call it? Um, the capital of New York, it's not New York City, Albany all the way, driving your car all the way, but yeah, three hours, that's one. Think about also the economic gain that the city of Burlington could have if we have a stop there. Think about how easy it will be for the economy, for tourists to come here, for tourists to stop, for tourists to visit. But I think there are good sizes about it. But the downside is just the quality of life issue that this might have on residents, small portion of residents, it will be. And the second thing, it also our bike lane will be removed. Even though the bike lane is on the federal, uh, in the federal lane, so we did uh, uh, we did work with them to have it, to have access to it. But I personally do think, if I was a mayor, I would push to have it. This is personally just me while we work on making sure that it won't affect people that much. To me, economically, it's good. Environmentally, it's perfect. That's just me. So that's one of the things that we are looking for, and I think that's a great question. You can stop here, but there may not be an overnight. Maybe the federal... Interestingly, I was at the Ward 2, because I, I represent Ward 2 and 3 also, and at the Ward 2 and 3 NPA the other evening, Kurt uh, was there, who's chair of transportation, and he said that the, as far as the overnight is concerned, the absolute goal is to get up to St. Albans. So uh, their, the state plan is 
to fix that rail up to St. Albans, and that's where the overnight's going to be. And the other issue that he did highlight is the reason why they need that extra rail is because Vermont Rail says they won't move their operations or make accommodations. So there's some pushback that could be occurring on that one too. But the interesting, but the overnight, it in the long run, within within 12 months, not you know five years down the road. But my understanding was within 12 months they would actually be overnight against St. Albans. Hi, Ali. I just wanted to ask, so um, in regards to have, hearing from the business community in around City Hall Park and its design and the progress that's going, have you heard anything from the business community in regards to kind of the impact of the project and how long it's going on? Personally, no. But I think when we were debating this issue, the business community, most of them, almost 95, 97% was in favor to have this newly designed $6 million dollars. Park. I am pretty sure the effects of having the park currently as it is due to construction um, will certainly have some effect. But the good thing also having this park constru construction currently going on, at least there is no homeless people experiencing homelessness hanging out there. And I think it brings some type of level of safety, especially now it is getting darker earlier and the park no one is hanging out around there, right? But I do personally think it's a great thing for the city. But I don't know I, what I agree with that. I'm also I'm also speaking of between tongues because I'm also representing the Burlington Farmers Market, just knowing that we've heard there's a huge impact on those businesses in regards to not us being present and everything else. Um, but also we are as the farmers market we are also deeply impacted because we don't see the design fitting for us to be coming back. And so that's one of the things we want to bring up is that um, that's at stake right now for us in terms of a return to 2021. Yep. So, and I think, you know, um, that's a great question. And I think that when we were really having this debate, uh, the farmers market, you know, expressed, they knew that even maybe when the park is over, it's designed, they might not come back there. There is that possibility. And I think we're looking into memorial auditorium. There is something also that the city is working on, and soon we will be having a presentation about it. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think I like also the current place, where it is on Pine Street, personally. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, elected officials. Great part that you guys can all be here. We appreciate it. Yeah, you guys are staying, and we're going to start a discussion about the state budget. We got visual aids because numbers are boring, but I think fascinating in my own little way. So what we're going to do is we have two charts, and our job is in 20 minutes or less is to basically explain the state budget. So what we've done is Bob is going to talk about dollars in, I'm going to talk about dollars out, and this first pie chart are where our, our $6.1 billion comes from. So. This is a complicated thing, and 15 minutes is like a breath. Um, Process-wise, this is where the money sort of goes. How it gets to this point, uh, legislative process-wise, is a lot of people think the governor puts a, a budget together, but the governor puts a budget proposal together, and it comes to the committees in the House and the Senate to fund it, uh, reallocate it, decide where your money is going to be spent. Uh, tremendous amount of pressure on those things. Uh, one thing I'd like to say at the beginning is um, there are a couple of committees in the House. One's the Ways and Means. They decide where the money is going to come from. 
what gets taxed and how much and that sort of thing. The other is appropriations, which decides where it's going to go. And if you ever sit in the House, you see these people just disappearing all the time as they go back to their committee room and eat lunch, do everything. Uh, it's an all-encompassing task. They're going to start meeting next week. Everybody else is not going to start until January 7th. Um, but that's, that's kind of the work that goes into this. Um, as we go around the, the horn here, federal funds come in. Uh, a lot of that is match money, uh, match to a lot of the general fund stuff, which is a lot of the, the state taxes that you pay, uh, sales tax, your property tax, education directed funding uh, over here. Um, special funds are legion. There are a lot of them, and they don't really make up that much of the budget in total. Uh, transportation money, which is often directed back to transportation projects, although some of it now has been redirected out of the transportation fund to other places. Um, that's sort of how the pie is initially set up. I contacted the chair of the Appropriations Committee and asked her what kind of pressures are going to be on the budget this year, and she sent me two pages of these are things that are going to be considered just because of stuff that we're thinking about, minimum wage. Um, it's like, okay, that everybody's minimum wage should go up to 15 bucks. You probably heard last year that the rollout of that is it's going to severely impact Medicaid funding because a lot of the projects that we fund are based upon how much people are paid when they are providing the services that we're offering. So there's so many dominoes that fall when we make one choice over here that rolls on to something else that, although Jean loves the numbers, uh, I think she'll even have a challenge of getting it all together in 10 minutes. That's true. Okay, so this is where the money goes. And I'm going to... Just sit down and I'm going to cheat. So the point I want to make here is this, the, this is our $6.1 billion budget. And going through, you're looking at you know, natural resources and transportation, debt and pay act, the labor costs. Your education, which is 28% of our budget, that's the very long, all pre, pre K to 12 education, all the education expenses. That's the lion, that is 20% of our total budget. Now pop down to human services, corrections, and Medicaid. And what Bob was talking about was with the advent of a $15 minimum wage, as that happens, our Medicaid costs start going up. We lose Medicaid. Um, protection is, is police and fire, is police and fire, actually police. And then we have the small, the very general government and miscellaneous. So, when you look at all of this, the governor is saying he's concerned about a $20 million shortfall. He's asking all of his departments to let, to come in at a lower, at a, I believe it's a 20%, a 20% lower budget. Now we've got a 1.38 rate of inflation right now, so we're in a low inflation situation. However, every single one of these budgets is impacted by, by cost of living increases, planned pay raises which are negotiated with the union and all of the other additional costs that come in every year so even though so when the, you hear the governor's asking for a 20 percent reduction in in budget you're really looking at 25 to 26 percent by the time you factor in both inflation and all of the other inflationary factors that are it, it built into a budget Impressive. That's that's one dollar out of every four. Twenty-five percent seems like a, a, a mystery number, but when we talk about money that comes from the state to fix our roads and bridges and yada yada yada, that's a significant cut that he's proposing. Yeah. So those are the challenges. So and and it, it, you can see 
there aren't a lot of moving parts to this budget. There really aren't. And when you really, you know, when you start digging into Medicaid or start digging into education, we're not talking about a budget with vast amounts of, of fat in it. This is a pretty lean budget, and it's been a pretty lean budget for years. The key to this is, and it's the hardest answer, is economic development. We need more people here, we need more taxes, we need more businesses here. And we need a better business environment. And a better business environment is not that we, is one where we have hands-on learning for small business. 45% of all of our businesses in the state of Vermont have four employees or under. What would be ideal is a more aggressive Commerce Department that puts on classes and works closely with those small businesses, bookkeeping, uh, employment services, how do they train, all of the kind of training dollars, workforce development for small businesses, for all of the things we need to do to build this economy, because we're not going to cut our way out of this budget. Oh, and on December 4th, where the three of us, uh, your state reps, will be down in the legislature that's when the Joint Fiscal Office will give us their uh, estimate of what's going on with the economy. The state economist will give us an overview of what's going on, and Joint Fiscal will run through every single budget and what the strains are. And we'll be able to report back to you with that report in the January meeting. And that will get make sure we get it to you online, because it really is a printed report and it's really thorough. But it lays out the groundwork of what the challenges are. Yeah. So I guess we're up to the questions. Although, i emphasize what Jean said. Most of the things that you... Let me make sure the cheerleaders didn't come back. Uh, most of the things that you see in that pie graph that we had are not discretionary. There are things that basically have to be paid every year. Um, so she's 100% right. The margin of things that can be pushed and shoved around uh, is relatively small. And to further emphasize the point that Jean made, um, we're working on the implementation of the Vermont Secure, Green Mountain Secure Retirement Plan, which is a plan that allows uh, small employers to offer their employees retirement benefits through a, a plan that we cooked up under federal regulation. And we just got numbers the other day. I think close to 97% of the employers in Vermont have 50 or less employees. So we're really talking uh, a state that thrives on small business. Only 11% of the population, the working population of Vermont has what we would consider adequate retirement planning, 11%. So that's Medicare, that's Medicaid, that's all of the home, the home, the, the all of the costs of helping people in their old age on a fixed income with not enough money. So all of these things are important, and they're just challenging. And the other thing we would talk about earlier too is the changes, the federal changes. I won't go into it, but there's a threat of. Pardon me. Do, tell, hold on one second. Could you come, come up one more second? Just explain briefly. I mean, this is just scary. This, this is a very, this, this is a real and present danger. Um, so in addition to being on the steering committee, my day job is at Hunger Free Vermont, and Representative O'Sullivan and I, before this, we were talking about some of the various threats that are coming from the Trump administration. Obviously, at Hunger Free Vermont, we are very concerned about the threats to Three Squares Vermont, which is our state's SNAP or food stamps program. Um, there have been three threats at the federal level in the last 12 months. And what's interesting is a lot of these threats were actually tried to be put through the Farm Bill. Congress rejected them. And now they're trying a different way, a different, yep, <laughs> um, to try to change the rules. Representative Hooper was just saying, you know, I'm trying to change the policy. Two of these threats have been to eligibility for Three Squares Vermont. The one that is, um, we're really concerned about, the 
try not to jump too far into the wonkiness of this, um, but it would affect 26,000, or, well, about 68% of all households that are on three squares Vermont right now would see their benefits cut. And it's tied to, the state does a really good job of making sure that Vermonters can meet their high heating costs, as we all experienced this week, in addition to making sure that you can actually afford food. And so it's a really cruel timing for the rollout as well, in my opinion. What makes this even more cruel, in addition to the 68% of households that would be affected by a, a cut, 80% of households that have an older Vermonter or a person with a disability would see a cut. And what Representative O'Sullivan was talking about, this would result in $26 million in federal funds being removed from the Vermont economy. That's not counting the multiplier effect of people going out and spending money at the local retailers. It's 26 million right there. So this is a huge potential threat to the funding for the state as well. And I'm hoping I'm summarizing what you wanted. Perfect, because what's going to happen with that is we're not going to... Thank you. We should... But honestly, it, that means we're going to have... The state of Vermont is not going to let our people starve. We'll end up making that money up in the budget. That's, that's really frightening. Eric Bunsen, Ward 4. Um, I'd like some clarification on your statements with regards to the proposed uh, $15 minimum wage. From what you were saying, it sounded like you were saying the $15 an hour minimum wage was too expensive for the state. And I'd like some clarification on that, or maybe I've just misunderstood you. No, I don't think that, uh, I mean, drive two miles from here up to McDonald's and you're finding, you know, right out of high school they're offering 13, or I think even 14 at one point dollars for people to come in and, I won't say what, um, but there is a rollout because when we pay, I think your Howard Mental Health Services through Medicaid, to uh, provide service to a, an affected population, if we raise the minimum wage that they're going to be paying, the state needs to be aware that there's going to be a pass-through of that wage back to the grant that we're paying them. So the, the point is that when you make a change to something here, there's a domino over here that's going to fall that you also have to take into consideration. So you know, raising a wage a buck, you look out in the community and say, well, that's not going to affect the state, that's going to affect private employers. Um, it's not, because we also are an employer through other parties. So there's, there's costs that are a little bit masked. At the same time, uh, which is all true, that that has the effect both on employers and state funding, that also means that any dollar that's paid to a worker, the people who are working on minimum wage are not saving this money it's going right back into the economy. And so there, it, it, you, it's never a simple yes or no, but if you look at the macro of it, it makes sense to wa ra raise our minimum wage so that we can have a survivable economy. Yeah, I, I've said for a while, I think the minimum wage argument is uh, an economic stimulus package, particularly for small businesses, because you know if you're if you're walking into the short stop down here, somebody's going to buy this, that, and the other thing because they all of a sudden have money in their pocket, and that gets rolled around in the economy two or three times. Uh, it's a good thing. So I have a finishing comment and then a question actually for you as well. Um, so, like Representative O'Sullivan said, the state is fighting hard against that proposal, but um, the way that all of us can help fight it, I'll make sure that goes out on front porch for him as well. It would make a huge impact for Vermonters. So, it's really important. It actually would hurt um, Vermont the most in the country, which is really crazy too. So, we're really hoping we can get as many comments opposing it as possible. Now, for a more selfish reason, <laughs> Um, you had mentioned the minimum wage. Another thing that was up in the legislative session last year was the paid family and medical leave. That would again, right, that would again have some budget implications. Any ideas on how that looks for the session? 
they're both going to they're both going to hit this, the floor of the house re in January. Um, the governor is softening on his stance, and had said that the the current one is he had the voluntary private plan, and he's still holding on to the concept of voluntary. But now he's saying, well, maybe we could start in voluntary and then make it required. So I think you're seeing some movement. My understanding from leadership is that they'll both be teed up almost instantaneously, and we are hoping we will have a veto-proof majority on both of them. Thanks very much. Thank you both, and now we will go to the coalition seeking redesign of Champlain Parkway. Bunny Reddington and Steve Goodkind. Anyway, for those that are still awake out there, this won't be a presentation of just the design of something like connection. We've got something much more important to talk about that's happened in the last, well, it happened a month ago, but it's just been announced recently. As all of us know, the Southern Connector project's been around for a long time. And you've heard recently it's going to, out to bid, going to be built real soon. It's all going well. Um, Tony and I are part of a group called the, the uh, Pine Street Coalition. And we've been challenging, not that there shouldn't be a project, but this particular project is not the project the city should be building. In fact, when I was public works director, the city fought for three years against this specific project. The biggest problem being it takes care of traffic down in the home Flint Avenue area, but then it takes it all up through Pine Street, Maple Street, King Street neighborhood. It's always been a no-no for the project. The federal government forced this upon us. That's the route. We, at the last, it's a, really as a last minute thing, challenged the final decision to put the product out to bid. We filed papers in federal court. We listed about five different reasons uh, why the project had problems. One of them was something that we had tried to argue back when I was public works director, something called environmental justice. What environmental justice says is you don't build a project that disproportionately impacts low-income and minority neighborhoods. And the project never had that problem in the past because it always went around those neighborhoods. But the current design does go right through it, right through that Pine uh, Maple Street area. Anyway, we heard from the Justice Department that they thought that their stuff was in good shape, except they did agree, surprisingly, with our claim about environmental justice. They said, yes, you're right. That hasn't been looked at. It needs to be looked at. So they asked us to put our suit aside and let them go back and see what they can come up with and see what kind of environmental justice issues there might be. They asked for 90 days. 90 days went by. Their attorney, attorney for Department of Justice, uh, called our attorney and said, we need more time. We're going to file papers asking for more time. We're all for that. The longer it takes to build the wrong thing, the better. So they said, we ask for more time, we'll send you the paperwork. We sent over the paperwork. Uh, she fought, the, our attorney faxed it or emailed it to me and Tony. Didn't read it. But she was doing something else. She thought she knew what it said. So I said, okay, I'll read it. You know, on page four was what I think the most astounding statement and maybe the most important thing that's happened in the Southern Connector in 10 years. What it said was, on October 11th, 2019, the Federal Highway Administration and the Vermont Department of Transportation, or VTRANS, filed a notice in the Federal Register that the record of decision, this is a document that certifies this product and authorizes it to be built. The record of decision from 2010 has been rescinded. That means this project has nothing now. And all the talk about it going forward and going forward in this fashion is gone. And that's something we didn't even quite expect. But I think it opens up a great opportunity now to get the right project built. We can now go back, hopefully, and if the city will cooperate and get a project that does good, because you need some traffic release, leave in that area, but not a project that does the bad things. 
going through the wetlands and going through the neighborhood. So it's a blessing in disguise. I think the mayor, the mayor really has to wake up about this and realize this is what we want. I'm sure it's going to take a little bit longer, but we can get a project that we want and the project that we've always supported and not have to do something we don't want only later to have to do another project to fix that. So that's something, the news has been slow to pick up on it. I think CX might have had something last night, but you're probably hearing this, most people be hearing this for the first time, that no matter what you hear, this project lacks a record of decision, which means it lacks everything to move forward. Not a dollar is allowed to be spent now to advance this project. And I think the public works director said everything's fine, it's gonna go forward soon. That's just so much malarkey. Not going anywhere fast in this form, as far as we can tell. And hopefully it's gonna come out as a much better project. We're not NIMBYs, we're not saying no project, but a project that goes through that neighborhood, as far as I'm concerned, is off the table, it should be off the table. The city, as I said, argued against this project years ago. So it isn't like this is something we're thinking of. This is the city's official position to be against this. But they've gone along with the building of it because they thought they had no choice. And one thing this also seems to allow now is, and you've heard the mayor say this, if you don't go ahead with the project, we could have to pay the money back, millions of dollars that have been spent developing the project. Well, I don't think that was probably gonna happen, but let's say it was. With this new development, the project is going to go back, hopefully, and be looked at again, but not because the city asked it to go back, it's because the Department of Justice said it has to go back. So we're probably free of that worry about having to pay any money back. We're doing a new design. So this is, to me, this is the best of all worlds under the circumstances. And I think a lot of people feel that way, and a lot of people will be relieved by this. Even in his heart of hearts, I think the mayor might even be relieved by it, because he was going to be doing something which even he knew was not really a good thing. He had come up with another project to correct that in the future. I might not have to do that anymore. So. That's, I think, more exciting than looking at the design or thinking about you know, what ideas there are. There's plenty of good ideas out there. They'll all hopefully get vetted as this goes through another process. But I think there's real hope now. We're going to get a, a good project, and where the needs need to be met, we'll get them. You know, the project was going to do harm. There won't be a project in that area anymore. So I think we'll all be proud of that, I hope. So that's my five minutes. I'm tired as you are. Oh, thank you, Steve. Tony Reddington. Um, first, I'll just mention that we have three uh, pieces of literature on the back table. This is some comments on that were submitted uh, on environmental justice by citizens and individuals. Uh, and pick up a copy on the back table. Uh, this is an overall, uh, you know, explanation of some key issues of the parkway. For example, on the front page here, you notice there's a, uh, a separate walk and bike facility and a road. Uh, there is not a single inch of sidewalk. Uh, the 30, in the $47 million expenditure, there's not a single inch of separate bikeway. And that's a real concern, obviously, to the Walk Bike Council, why they supported and have supported our Pine Street uh, group since uh, since we began four years ago. We're about 200 people, uh, and we've been at this for four years. And finally, we'll talk about, I'll talk about the roundabout briefly. Uh, there's a, a new federal highway flyer. Um, and by the way, roundabout conversions are supported by ARP, AAA, GEICO, primarily because they reduce uh, serious and fatal injuries by about 90%. Okay, the roundabout down at uh, the, uh, what the community calls uh, down the south end, they call this the intersection of death. So there is a real concern. Uh, both Steve and I uh, were at uh, Ward 6 at, during a presentation last month on the roundabout. The reason it costs $9 million is because roundabouts are expensive to build. If the fact is there's 37,000 feet of utilities under that, that particular intersection. If you're going to work on an intersection, you really need to be one and done in terms of getting all the utilities sorted out. So um, the key reason the particular uh, project is a safety project under federal highway legislation, and it was our Senator Jeffords who put the word roundabout for the first time in federal statute. It's on a list of safety act, safety projects that you can can be funded at 100%. So it's very, I, it's very ironic that the first, uh, I think, first roundabout that's being constructed in Vermont uh, is using those Jeffords monies, that uh, that Jeffords uh, provision that was uh, put in, in statute in 2005. And uh, Senator, actually Governor Scott was part of the, um, just had some input with the Senator at that time. Um, 
Okay, so uh, this, if this project, if this particular roundabout at uh, um, Locust, uh, uh, at the King Street, uh, uh, at the King Street School, um, Christ the King Street School, and Shelburne, Shelburne Road, uh, St. Paul, and South Willard, um, that, that would be about the fourth or fifth highest crash location, according to the Agency of Transportation, the state of Vermont. Burlington has 20 intersections. 19 of them are, are signalized that have average 1.5 injuries a year. This particular intersection uh, is not on the list. Why? Because they've taken that out because they're going to build the roundabout. Okay. Um, but I will, there'll be a, an opportunity for questions, but I think that gives uh, the reason why that, that project's being done. And um, the, you can put in a mini roundabout, which is, uh, we don't have to go into detail here, for about fifty to $75,000. So they'd all, the, the cost of this particular one is, uh, I'll call it a little unusual, a little high. Um, if you look at the, uh, so the environmental document that was rescinded on October 11th, um, it's 340 pages. It's all available to you on the DPW website. You can go and read all the certain sections. But it dates back to the early, uh, about the 2002, 3, 4, 5 period. The census that they used is 2000. We've got a census since, and we've got one coming up this next year. The traffic data is totally out of date. If you read this particular document, there is, a, I think the word safety appears 10 times in 340 pages. There's no discussion of safety. Uh, there's no discussion whatsoever of climate change, or the, what we call now the you know, uh, climate emergency. Not, not a paragraph, yet we have one of the most advanced climate action plans here in the city. Uh, the, another way to look at this is that this, pro, this document, which uh, we found in the case of environmental justice, is so out of date uh, that and this one item alone is enough to get it kicked out of the, uh, kicked back to take another examination. It looks like our best estimate is that it's going to be in January that they say the federal people say we're going to come back and, and to the court because we are in U.S. District Court right now. Um, they may ask, they say that we'll, we'll tell you the court then whether we want another three months, which would take this into April. And we filed a court case on D-Day the 6th of June. We may not even get a chance to sit down and discuss a schedule for this challenge to this very document that got pulled last month until next June. We, have st we want to see a quality project, a, a street that people can love, in which this generation has a chance to sit down and participate. Uh, the original, original purpose and need for this project was to move cars basically from the interstate to downtown, uh, I-189 to downtown. That makes no sense today. What needs to be done is a street that serves the needs of the neighborhood rather than the needs of, uh, of, of getting from the interstate to downtown. So I guess to, to summarize, having, we've been at this about four years. We, we, are, we firmly believe that um, the two things that are missing in this project, in addition to environmental justice, is there's no provision for, for people who walk and bike to have a safe pathway, with your, whether you're going to school or you wanna, you're, you're going to work, you should have a separate uh, bikeway like here in the North Avenue plan. The, the plan up here basically is the model for, this, for, the, for the parkway. There'll be uh, a cycle track, protected bike lanes, not these painted lines, but you have some protected bike lane um, uh, throughout the corridor, and secondly, safe roundabouts at key intersections. Um, stop there and take some questions. Would you mention south, on North and South Winooski Avenue slightly? I don't think people are aware that live out here the impact that may have on them if they want to go downtown. Um, I, I've been following this fairly closely because I live on North Winooski Avenue. Uh, basically, the proposal is to have. Uh, uh, some type of protected bike lane, some top to bottom, and there's an effort on the part of the city to take parking away from 
uh, entirely one side from Riverside at uh, you know where the uh, health center is all the way down to Howard Street at the bottom. Um, that's going to run into that's already run into really huge opposition at the hearing that was held uh, a meeting that was held uh, last week. Um, I do not know how that's going to work on it. I'm very I, I'm primarily concerned about that there should be some kind of of um, bike facilities that, that benefit and, and help businesses. Uh, that may be on the sidewalk level rather than the street level. And secondly, that the intersections, I almost got killed at uh, Pearl and, and uh, North Winooski. Uh, the guy diving to make, coming down North Winooski, hanging a left to go up Pearl Street, the hill, and, and dives in just as the red light's coming on. Um, we, we need to do something to make our intersections safe. Pearl is one of the crash 20 intersections that's one of the worst. It, it has more than one injury a year. Um, so uh, I think that there's a, an understanding that we need to make improvements to the, the Winooski Avenue. Uh, all I can suggest is you, you can follow this. Um, there, will, there will be more another public meeting, another draft report. Um, hope that you'll... Uh, um, I would ask that some of your representatives of those concerned about transportation up here, A.J. Uh, uh, comes to mind, and some others that are, are, are active. Uh, uh, Griffin uh, uh, is another one. Uh, and encourage them to get back to you and, and, and to monitor this process. This project has been obviously in the works for decades. And I guess I'm really confused as to the actual goal. You say it used to be to move traffic from 89 to downtown. It doesn't appear, at least for you guys, an opinion that that's what's needed or wanted now. I don't understand what the purpose of this road is. You're using words like bicycles and pedestrians and this was supposed to be a road to move cars. Um, maybe talk to us about your vision of what this crazy thing is supposed to do, because it doesn't sound like it has anything to do with the original intention. And it sounds like you're proposing just a road you're, and a bike path. You're on the right track. When the road was first proposed, it would look like an interstate, an extension of the interstate. Right. Fort Lane nowhere, and then all the way up to Battery Street, isolated from Pine Street. It's changed, and that's part of the problem. The other, the road through the barge canal was probably not buildable, so it has changed. And what's happened is now the road that was built for cars now is being directed into a neighborhood. That's the problem, and there's ways around most of that, but. That's not what the federal government wanted to allow us to do. Now we may have an opening to go back and look at alternatives that don't go through the neighborhood and still move cars, but doesn't disproportionately uh, affect the neighborhood. Just as a very simple example, there'll be relief from traffic on Flynn and Home Avenues. Their traffic will decrease by about 79%. On Pine Street, it will increase by 37%. So the low-income neighborhood gets a significant increase. The non-low-income neighborhood gets a significant decrease. That would be the exact opposite of the definition of environmental justice. So the project's running into uh, a problem because it really was designed for cars at the expense of residential neighborhood. And so there's ways around that if the city will be flexible. And it might turn out that we don't even need that roadway in the northern part of the, of the project. My view would be it would end at Flynn Avenue. That would be it. Everything that happens from Flynn Avenue North is mostly negative things. It takes, it deals with wetlands, deals with hazardous waste, and deals with neighborhood issues. Just forget it. Call it a day. And uh, I don't, that's my personal view now. It, I don't call the shots there. It would be a process to go through. But that would probably be a project that would do just about as much good as it could do and do as least harm it could do and just have to realize you're not going to push traffic through a neighborhood in this day and age. There's laws against it. So that's what we think. A couple of other quick things. Uh, the traffic's actually declined since uh, 2000 on both Shelburne Road, north of Flynn, uh, and also it's declined on Pine Street, whereas large increases are projected. So part of that purpose and need 
it isn't as strong as it was. And secondly, since the roadway couldn't go through directly to uh, the Battery Street because of that, and that's because of the Superfund site, <laughs> and the routing had to go now through existing streets. That's another reason why we should draw back and redraft. That's redesign, and that's that's. Uh, and we're talking about the community attitude. And Steve was, I think, at the same meeting I was when they brought up the um, South End uh, Plan BTB. Um, almost unanimous opposition to that front to the parkway, and that was three years ago. It, there's no real support for it down there. What is the street that you bring up behind you in the picture? That's Pine Street at uh, uh, right at uh, Maple, and that's about it. You could put one of those in there uh, in a couple of weeks. It's a mini roundabout, and it would have go from roughly five or six, excuse me, it's about a eight or ten minute wait right now every afternoon, and it would drop to around uh, uh, 30 to 40 seconds. This was uh, done by an engineer who had built the first roundabout in Vermont. Uh, it's AARP's uh, report uh, following a, a three day workshop in 2014, and that's a, that, that is a uh, uh, would service that particular design to service all all vehicles. Yeah, we could we could do this next week. I thought one of the original reasons we were doing this thing was the, the traffic on Flynn Avenue with the trucks. So, in any redesign, wouldn't we still want to have something that'll that'll funnel those trucks? The road on? to nowhere. Finish it. And the road to nowhere will bring it go just the industrial parkway. You bring the trucks to where, you, where it right, should be. That's and where then, they're going. Right, and then that that's it. Just right. Historically, the project well, was always there was always a possibility the project could have built in segments. The road to nowhere could have been a standalone project, but for political reasons, to go way back in the project history, it was decided that we had to keep it as one project. Those that wanted all of it said we'll not finish any of it until we can get it all. And they sort of are holding everybody hostage, not finishing the road to nowhere. And the theory was if they did that, that would probably take the pressure off building the rest of the road. And that's sort of stuck, but there's no reason. There's no reason why the road could not be, the road to nowhere built, put a street back where Briggs and Batchelder have been torn up and are gravel now. Call it a day. There's, there's nothing stopping that from happening except the will to actually do it. And that's it. We're hoping something like that might come of it. And then the rest of it, don't do anything until you have a better solution than they're proposing to do right now. All right. Thank you both. We're going to stick with our agenda. And um, Madeline's coming up now to an update on our resource rate. All the people who left don't know is you're all getting discounts on your water bill. <laughs> I wish I could hand out a little bit. Why is it more quietly? Maybe some a lot of city microphones you have to be right on top of. So uh, my name is. your water resources utilities, your water, wastewater, stormwater utilities. And I know we're all excited to get to the debate, so I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible, but still speak intelligib intelligibly and take time for questions. So bear with me. Go ahead. So first of all, I just want to make sure everybody knows where your money goes when you pay your water sewer or stormwater bill. What are you actually paying for? We're going to talk about that and our increased in cap capital investments, and then talk about why it is that we're embarking upon this rate and affordability study. Uh, this is the initial effort to just tell you about the options that we are considering. We're not proposing anything, nothing's being voted on. This is just, hey, this is what we're doing for the next couple months and want to make sure that everybody here, as well as all the people who already left, you know, come to the, the next level of meetings. Um, and then we'll talk about the project schedule. Next slide. So 
at its basic, basic level, we believe that access to clean water is a human right. The UN believes it, I believe it, my people believe it. And that's comprised of two things. First of all, we need to make sure that our stuff works, our pipes work, our wastewater treatment plants work, our drinking water treatment plants work. But sometimes when we start to look at how much money that costs, because um, our water is still rather cheap, it can start to butt up against the affordability of services. Our current water is not that expensive. Um, it's probably on the higher side of, of, of Vermont. Um, and it's not much higher when you look across the nation. We're pretty normal. But as we start envisioning where we might go, if we're really going to take care of our aging infrastructure, we might have an affordability problem. Next slide. Not everybody knows this, but, but water resources like BED, Burlington Electric, is an enterprise fund. It's entirely a separate fund. We don't receive any taxpayer dollars. And in fact, some of our money do goes towards uh, funding other parts of the general fund. We do receive some services from them. Um, every, every dollar you pay on the water side has to stay in the water bucket, wastewater, so on and so forth. Um, we provide the three services to all of Burlington residents, and we do smel sell a small amount of wholesale water to Colchester. And that's a leftover from, I think, in the 70s and 80s when we actually provided water to, Bur to South Burlington, Winooski, and other parts of Colchester, which now are served by Chittenden, sorry, by the Champlain Water District. Next slide. So the Water Enterprise Fund, obviously it provides drinking water. We have our own drinking water treatment plant it's in between the Moran plant and the Coast Guard. We withdraw from Lake Champlain, which is a very clean drinking water source. Um, and we pump, we treat and pump that up to the uh, rest of the city. Comparatively speaking, sorry, I saw somebody shake their head. Comparatively speaking to the other source waters that the rest of the nation has to withdraw from, we are in a very good position. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. The other piece that water provides, which people don't always think about, is fire protection. So we have enough pumping capacity and we have sufficient pipe capacity that we can make sure that the hydrants and the sprinkler systems in large buildings have enough fire flow that if a really huge fire broke out, the fire department would be able to put enough fire, sorry, enough water on the fire, um, which results in improved insurance ratings. Next slide. And I do have copies of the presentation because I know we're going fast. There's a lot of asset stuff on there that some of you may be interested in. On the wastewater side, we've, we've often talked about it as wastewater, sewage, icky. What it is and what we do is really water recovery, right? You're taking clean drinking water in your toilet, you're putting things in it, and then it's our job to strip the dirty stuff out and try to get it as close back to good clean water before we discharge it back to the lake, which again is our source water. Um, we're a one water organization. It's really cool that I'm able to think about stormwater, wastewater, and drinking water because it's all the same thing getting recycled over and over again. Um, our wastewater treatment plant also does because we have a combined sewer system in some parts of the city where there's one pipe for sewer and stormwater. Even though it doesn't always work perfectly, and I will acknowledge that 2018 was not a great year, um, when it does work, we treat millions and millions and millions of gallons of stormwater that if it was in a separate system, like a lot of the city, it would go straight to the lake with all of its dirty pollutants. Which leads us to, next slide, stormwater, which is the, relatively speaking, the baby of the three waters. For a long time, people thought stormwater, it's just rainwater, no big deal, it's clean. But anybody can look at the roadways, whether it's the summer or after the winter or the spring in particular, the winter, bleh, um, there's a lot of pollutants on the roads and that all gets washed off. So even though stormwater, at its face is not as dirty on an acute level as wastewater, um, it does create a load. Over time, it generates a lot of pollutants and gets that to our water bodies, and that's something that we work day in, day out to either prevent those pollutants from getting in, and then on the combined sewer side, we work really hard to just keep the stormwater out of that pipe. Stormwater doesn't want to be in the pipe. It wants to be either in the ground, reconnected back to its hydrologic cycle, or captured in trees and evapotranspirated off. And we're always trying to figure out how to let the water be what the water wants to be, which is those sorts of things. Next slide. So I said um, a big part of our job is making sure we're taking care of our infrastructure. And you can see for a long time, I'm probably in front of the graph, FY13, you know, we were spending some amount on capital investment, but not nearly enough. And starting in about FY17, that's when we had, this, with the support of Burlington voters, the water bond, and we started to really start fixing our water pipes. 
And then starting in this year, FY20, with the support of the wastewater, the Clean Water Resiliency Plan bond, we're starting to tackle some of our wastewater aging infrastructure issues and as well as get started on some combined sewer stuff. Now we try to keep all these costs down. We apply for every grant we can. Um, we actually have a million dollar grant to tackle combined sewer stormwater. Um, but nonetheless, those costs plus our ever increasing operation and maintenance costs does mean that we have had modest rate increases for many of the past years, I think it, for, with the exception of 2015. Next slide. So it brings us to you know, your current bill. Who here knows what they pay for water? Sewer storm. 40 bucks, so you're pretty average, but not in that kind of way. Um, about, about 50, just under 50 bucks a month is your typical single family residence, which uses about 400 cubic feet, which is about 3,000 gallons. Uh, if you look at the EPA website, this is way below what the nation uses, so we're already doing good. Um, we're doing pretty well, or pretty similarly to uh, what the rest of the region, sort of a crunchy, environmentally sensitive New England city does, um, based on what our consultant has said. But nonetheless, as I said, we did have last year 4.6% rate, rate increase. And when I start looking out at what I'm going to need in the next five years, and part of this process is to really do that financial planning, I can't say that we're not going to need these incremental modest rate increases, particularly since there was a 10-year period in the 90s where we had no rate increases, and I'm not even sure how anything got done. But that's a whole other story. Next slide. So the, the council, Chapin and I were certainly had been talking about this, um, and then the council certainly agreed. Every time I go to them for a rate increase, oh, thank you. Um, every time I would you know, go to them with a rate increase, they started to become more concerned about this affordability piece. And so we ended up doing an RFP and hiring um, one of the top water resources rate consultants um, in the country to really help us look at this process, to make sure we're doing the financial planning, to make sure we're recovering all of the costs we need to, and that we're doing it in an equitable way. A residential rate payer may not be the same as a commercial rate payer, right? That residential person needs that essential access to water, whereas one could say, commercial folks, it's kind of part of your business commodity and you might be able to handle that cost in a different way. We also want to make sure that even if we look at our rate structure, and we'll talk specifically about how we may change our rate structure, there's also going to be those folks who are ready and in the future, even with adjustments to our rate, may still be paying a huge portion of their annual income just to get access to this essential amount of water. And so we need to have wraparound programs, folks who may already qualify for some other income-based program we may be able to show proof of that and maybe get an additional discount if it all works out. Next slide. So some of the, um, some of the things that we're looking at on the recovering costs and stabilizing revenue, um, there's, a, there's a number of different charges that we don't currently charge for that we're looking at that would primarily impact commercial entities and or new construction. Um, for instance, fire protection charges, those sprinkler systems that I talked about. It costs us money to have the ability to pump Right now, people with the sprinkler system, other than the, I think, fire department charges them a fee, they don't get charged anything for that sprinkler system. We're looking at whether or not that's possible. On the residential side, the one thing we may be looking at changing within the rate structure is, um, I don't know if anybody ever looks closely at their BED bill or a Vermont gas bill, there's that customer charge or the access charge, which has nothing to do with how much you use. We don't have that. However, we have lots of fixed costs, just like those folks, so we're probably looking at doing some sort of fixed charge that even if somebody doesn't use water, we're still recouping our costs. The big piece, and I think this is the piece that I'm hearing most people get excited about, is changing our rate structure from one where everybody gets charged the exact same amount, doesn't matter how much you're using, to a, um, a tiered rate, which is right here. So if you think about that and other tiered rates, that initial lifeline amount of water, an initial lifeline amount of water, um, the part that everybody needs, maybe we, we charge a smaller amount for that, right? And if you're able and you want to use and take a 30-minute shower, have at it, more revenue for, for me and my system, but we're going to charge you more. Same thing with irrigation water. Maybe not the irrigation in the farm field, because that's growing food, but irrigation for golf courses or, or lawns. I'm don't, I don't have a value judgment. It's totally fine if you want to green, green grass, but... Maybe you're going to pay a little more for that because that's not life water, if you will. Um, and then that last bit, as I said, the low-income customers. How can we leverage other programs? I don't want to look at income 
We don't have economists, but there's enough other programs out there that I think we could leverage to help get people into a discount program when they need it. I'm almost to my last slide. What I wanted to say is I want everybody to stick with us and it's a probably gonna be a multi-phase approach. I don't want us to get stuck on what the affordability program in this first iteration doesn't do. For instance, we don't yet know how, and I'm fairly certain from the conferences I've gone to that everybody has a, a hard time with this. The renters, how do you reach renters? Because a lot of times you're not paying the water bill directly. If you are paying the water bill directly, a lot of these affordability programs would help you. But if you're somebody who rents and the, the water is part of the rent, there's not a good way. You're called a hard to reach customer. We're not stopping. We're gonna keep trying to figure out how to do that, whether it's through conservation programs and rolling landlords. There's lots of ways we may be able to get at it a back door, but this first iteration may not be, it's not gonna be perfect. And we don't want the enemy of the good to be, you know, the perfect. Um, and with that, very tight schedule. We're trying to get decisions from the city council by April 2020. We're kind of trying to go to the uh, city council as well as stakeholders would be invited um, <laughs> in February of 2020 with options. Um, we're gonna be trying to come back to the MPA so you guys can really see your bill could look like this, it could look like this, it could look like this. What do you guys think? Oh my gosh, we've messed it up. No, it's the best thing in the world. That's what we're hoping for. And then coming back to the Board of Finance City Council to actually get them to codify and say, yep, that's the rate structure we want. And with that, I will take questions. We have four minutes, but maybe. Nobody really wants to hear their opening statements. It's all the same thing. You want to see the, the battle of the debate later on. Okay, first off, thanks for coming and uh, the breakdown of the process and, and what you're looking at. It's very informative. Um, the one part that I was hoping to hear a little more about is um, all this investment, the money, I mean, we saw the graph, the amount that we're planning on spending in 2020 um, to reinvest and, and uh, basically fix some of the problems we have with our wastewater plant and other areas. Um, where's the best place to get that information on the details of, you know, or you could just say, hey, I feel real confident that we're going to be able to address the problems that we've had in the past with the, the what's been put out in the lake um, through this investment. Because I think that's how we got the vote. I think that's how you we got the approval, is that people saw, hey, there's obviously a problem here. Everybody knows we need to invest the money. Yeah, I actually don't know if we have a great place because it's been a bit of a whirlwind. We are underway. Um, we are underway with some huge projects, the disinfection system and the computerized control, those were the chief things that failed in 2018. And so those designs are underway and hopefully gonna be implemented next year, um, ideally before the summer season. The funding source that we're using from the state is not the fastest funding source, lots of hoops to jump through, so it hasn't, it hasn't gone as fast as I would like. Um, on the combined sewer overflow piece, the $1 million grant, uh, there's six projects under design right now that will be implemented next year and another six the following year. And every year we do combined sewer projects. But you're right, we don't have, and I have it in my head, like a map, a cool map of the city that says, hey, this is where all your money's going. Um, we have some, I can send you something that starts to approximate it, but that is a good plan that we need to, we need to do a better job of selling that. And, and thanking everybody for the awesome support that we got. I think that was um, part of the reason it got approved too. And um, is there a way to have the stormwater go out before the sewage goes out into the lake? Um, so you, one thing that comes up a lot is sewer separation. So the problem is having, oh, pardon? And it's not separated. Uh, it's not separated in all parts of the city. I have, um, I have a map back there. <laughs> Um, a large portion of the middle of the city and the south end is still combined. Uh, you guys do have actually right over there is your combined sewer overflow at, at the end of Gazo. So there are small portions of the new north end that are still combined. The new north end did benefit, it benefited from the sewer separation of the 1990s and that a large portion of the new north end is not combined anymore. However, that stormwater 
now run before it was going through the plant a lot of the time and now it gets it just goes straight to the lake and the river and so we're having to go back as part of the lake champlain total maximum daily load phosphorus cleanup plan and actually figure out how to treat the storm water that we took out of the wastewater so it's it's complicated and mostly we're relying on trying to just slow the slow the stormwater down so that it can get to the plant and can get to that good treatment. It's just when it all happens at once. But even even this, um, the Gazo CSO, it used to go off all the time, thousands of gallons. And in the Halloween storm, it did have a discharge, but it was 4,000 gallons, like minuscule compared to what it used to be because of some projects we did where we took the roof water off of, um, of actually Hunt and C.P. Smith, we, we did disconnect roof water because roof water is clean. So we do use sewer separation in places where it makes sense, but not generally when it's receiving road gunky runoff, in my opinion. And I, I, I can stay, I have to pack up so I can also an answer people's questions one-on-one. -on -one. Very much changing topics, but I'm really excited by the affordability programs. Is there anywhere else in the country that does this, or are you, is Burlington leading the way yet again? Um, no, we're probably not leading the way. I think we're leading the way for Vermont, as far as I can tell. But uh, Philly, Philly actually has the most comprehensive, progressive affordability program, which we would never be able to administer, um, where they they lock in your they lock in your billing rate as a percentage of your income um, if you're income burdened. Um, it's coming up more and more because all water utilities are in this like, oh crap, we have all this infrastructure and now we have to replace it. So. I think we'll see it more and more, and I think we may even see it in um, in Vermont more as people start to realize that their stuff is getting older and older and starting to break like it does here. Yeah. yeah. And I do, like I said, if, I, if anybody wants copies of the presentation, I've got it there. It's also online. Thank you very much. Yeah, and if you can help put the chairs on the racks, we'd appreciate it. Thanks for coming, everybody.